Hello once again everyone, and welcome to the episode of So What about the Flower of Battle. So this is coming out concurrently with our episode on the Kunstdesfektens, so go and check that out. And as such, I'm going to reiterate um, the message, as it were, of these videos in both of them. So when I was in school and writing papers, I would often be advised to get to the so what of whatever subject I needed to cover, to express the point, to reiterate the point, and to keep enforcing the point throughout the course of it. So that way, the takeaway lesson was always what I was trying to actually convey. And that's what this series is based on. The idea is if you are a newer student, or alternatively, you're someone that's just curious about another system, um, this is a video that you can reference quickly and understand, okay, were I to take a lesson in this or pursue this, what is, what is it about? Right? Now, in regards to the Flower of Battle, um, also sometimes known as Fiore's system, as it was made by the master, uh, master, I'm using the German terms, but uh, Fiore de Libere, it is a system of fighting that kind of about came around about the same time as the KDF, um, so we're talking early 1400s. Now, it is oftentimes called Italian longsword or the Italian tradition. This can be a little bit tricky as while yes, Fiore is Italian and does write in Italian, much like other systems at the time, he's actually a knight of the HRE and even references that he was taught by Germans. So really set aside your modern concepts of national uh, boundaries and I will refer to it as Italian. I think it's okay to refer to it as Italian because it's written in Italian. As such, you will learn Italian terminology as it goes on. But mind you, doesn't really have a whole lot to do with actual uh, geographical borders. Now, the biggest thing about the Flower Battle is that it is a unified system. So it's all based on the advice of one guy, which means that throughout the course of reading it, as he covers all these different subject matters, it is his direct advice, his direct opinion, and it is his direct work, which can be a quite nice change of pace if you're used to reading from multiple sources. Now, it's debatable as to whether or not he has any successors is the bit of the tricky part. It's kind of one and done, as it were. There are some theories that there are some successors to him, or alternatively later period um, longsword manuals or dispensing manuals do kind of reference some of his techniques, but that could also just be a regional thing. So, mind you, there is that. But contained within the Flower of Battle is a bunch of stuff, and we actually get a lot of extra context for the sword, which is going to be quite a bit of fun to tackle. But first and foremost, let's go ahead and go over the very basics. Now, helping me out today is Randy, uh, one of my longer term Italians, as I call them. But, first and foremost, we're going to need to learn some basic footwork, as this system is going to be a reservation type of footwork. So, normally, you get two options, right? You either pass into your attacks, and you always keep the hands on the side of the back foot with all of your movements, or you reserve the power leg. Now what this can mean is that, for example, if action comes in and I bring my sword across to do whatever I will do, either defending myself or reaching out to bind against someone, now I have that back leg ready to help me with my next action or take me out to the side or something along those lines. And this applies um, both ways. So as we'll get to later, when I have my right leg forward, my left leg now comes up with all of my grappling actions but is reserved until I'm ready to do it or if my left leg is forward, now my right leg can come up for most of my sword actions. What this means is that oftentimes you'll have your left leg forward and your sword extended and you're reserving this for part two of the play, whereas your opponent will be right foot forward when they finish their cut. Now, the other key bit of footwork that you're going to learn for this is going to be the volta stable, which means stable turn. The point of this is basically that I'm shifting my weight onto my back quadrant, so I'm not going straight backwards, I'm shifting my weight onto my back quadrant, which allows me now to push my hips forward as I shift my weight onto my lead foot. Don't think of this as a lunge. I'm not all the way back here, nor all the way back here. It's my normal stance, and I'm just folding back a little bit to channel that. What this allows for me to do is normally I would need to pass forward to bring my hip energy into it. Because I'm pulling back, I can now apply that same sort of energy without moving. Um, Fiore's recommendation is you use this to play to back and front. So, that's going to be a big part of it, and you're going to see it used a lot of the time. Now, in regards to philosophy, we're going to be a little bit more grounded. So rather than looking for springy, hard offline movements, we will still do those, but for the most part we're going to kind of keep our ground, use smaller steps, 
stable turns, and when we do bring that passing step up, it's meant to be the fight anchor. So bear that in mind. Now, the first and foremost thing we're going to learn is going to be going over the sword in one hand, which is a bit unique. Um, most systems don't cover this, but Fiore does. Now, the sword in one hand can be interpreted as being from the draw, as his initial position is going to be right here. So the sword is just held down, kind of on my left side, uh, as though I were pulling it out of the scabbard, though he never necessarily makes mention of this. But you can certainly do all the plays that way. The basic idea here being that when my assailant comes up at me with a long sword, be it in one hand or two hand or what have you, by putting myself in this position and bringing my hips back when he cuts at me, I can either beat his sword to the side with that turn, he comes at me again, I can close in and then strike or pommel or wrestle or anything along those lines, and if I need to, I can even transition deeper and do fun things from there. And if I fail to slice his throat here, I am a fool. The basic idea being, your sword is down, you pull your hips back, you apply that energy outward to deal with an incoming attack, either by knocking it offline or by covering yourself um, so that way you can close in. But all in all, relatively straightforward, both against a thrust and against a cut, the same sort of principle applies, but it is quite cool to see and you don't normally see it. Now, mind you, we don't necessarily know if that's a self-defense context, but don't try to just pull this off if you're in normal free sparring. It doesn't work. Now, when it comes to launching into the sword in two hands, that's where things are going to change a bit. So first and foremost, our system is going to be devised now of pretty much just six principal cuts, the thrust, and then we're going to mostly focus on guards. So we'll go over those cuts really quick, but um, we're not going to give them a ton of detail. So they are fendenti, the clothe fendenti, which is just cut down from either side from above. These are directed at the teeth slash the neck. We have the sotani, which are directed from the knee up to the face. It is debatable as to whether or not you are meant to use the short edge on both sides, the long edge on both sides, or just the short edge from your uh, left, and then the long edge from your right. You can interpret this in many ways. The way I like to do it is short edge from my left, short or long from my right. Now, the final one you'll have is the mezzana, which are going to be definitely long edge from my right, short edge from my left, it may seem strange at first, but I will go over it a little bit more. So all these are relatively straightforward. And then finally is the punt, uh, la punta, the thrust, which is going to just be anything that directs the point to the middle. So relatively simple. And all you need to do is utilize these cuts well to an opening, and you will hit them. So Fiore doesn't go into detail about attacking these different positions. Sometimes he mentions it, but for the most part, the general idea is going to be he's in guard, I'm in guard, there's my opening, right? And if I do that well and resolutely, we don't need to talk about this anymore. Instead, what is more emphasis is put on is the idea of fighting out of the posta. Posta positions or guards come in three flavors. You have powerful, stable, and instable, right? Posta tava, stabile, instabile. Now the idea here is going to be some positions are very apt for crushing other positions, knocking blows aside, or even entering into close range. Others are much more settled for you can wait in them for long periods of time. Um, now, long periods of time, we don't mean too long, but it's safe to stand there, essentially. And then instable are ones you want to be transitioning through or very quickly doing your device out of. So as an example of each, our first position that we're going to learn is going to be a powerful one, and it's going to be postidona. Now, this is specifically postidona soprana, the high version. You also see postidona done this way, but it's going to be I'm just pulled back, my sword is on my shoulder, and the idea now being that if he cuts at me, I bring all that energy down and across and very easily knock his sword aside. And then when I bring my right leg up, I can either thrust him, I could fire up that mezzana with the short edge, um, things along those lines, or very worse, I've driven his sword to the ground. I'm putting a lot of focus on fighting for this center line. Here's that again. He cuts at me. Okay. No problem. I bring that right foot up to do what I want to do. Now, that's an example of powerful. An example of instable is going to be Venestra. Venestra is the window guard. It's a very good guard, but I don't want to stand here forever, right? 
as when I stand here, I am giving him more and more time to think about what I'm going to do. Finestra can be used to cover yourself. For example, let's say I'm down here and he cuts at my side. I bring my sword up to protect myself, and then I can come back in or do whatever I need to do. Finestra can be interpreted as up to your head or even lower. Same basic idea. Now, what's most notable about Finestra is that I can launch strong thrusts from it. So, we're fighting, everything's great. Pop into Finestra, launch that strong thrust. He's not going to be very happy about that, right? As I have the ability to push this across my body and move into Pulse Longa. Now, another instable guard, but a very important one, is going to be Pulse Longa. So, this is kind of the, the all of the cuts and strikes are going to basically get here. Pulse Longa is full, formed by being left foot forward, and the sword is held extended at a slight angle um, in front of you. So if you'll notice, when I execute my cuts, pulse the longa. When I execute my thrusts, pulse the longa. And from there, we're going to get binds, but we'll get back to that again in a moment. Now, in regards to a stable position, we're going to have uh, mezza porta di ferro. The idea here being that down here in mezza porta di ferro, uh, middle iron gate, I am quite protected. As for him to break this guard, he will have to cl close in quite a bit. I can easily deflect whatever he wants to throw at me, and I can still launch powerful thrusts, rising cuts, and then falling blows. So it's a very good guard for me to just stand in for a minute, see what he's going to do. So an example of that would be, I'm down here, he goes to cut at me, no problem. Or alternatively, he goes to cut at me, cutting from the other side. Or alternatively, he goes to cut at me, nice, right? So to get at me, he really has to know what he's going to do. So that's a basic example of three kinds of guards of powerful, stable, instable. Now, let's get back to Postalonga as we introduce the kind of next thing. So you've been finding out these positions, but then there's more to it. So you're either going to end up in the close range game or the long range game. Now, the most easy way to sum this up would be if I can seed it, so that way my left foot is still forward, but his right foot has come forward, that's when most of the long range plays happen. Now, Fiora never gives us description of, you will cut out of this guard to get to this place. It's just, you are in the long range game. So you could end up here in a bunch of different ways. For example, he could cut at me, and I just cover. Now we're in the long range game. Alternatively, he could cut at me, I cut back at him. Now we're in the long range game etc. There's a bunch of different ways you could end up there. The important thing is that I am left foot forward and our swords are now bound out away from our hands. So we combine more of the tips or more in the middle and there's a little bit of differentiation there. So the basic idea from these are going to be when you're in the bind, you're pretty much going to control this iron line and then take them on the other side. So for example, we come in, we're here, okay, I'm going to flip up, cut that lead hand, I'm out of here. Or alternatively, we come in, he tries to reinforce a little bit, I'm going to bring up and attack on the other side, cutting his arm and thrusting, or just delivering the thrust initially, using my right leg to get me out of the way. Those are two simple examples. Some of the other plays that we're going to get here, and some of the more key ones that you often can do out of guards, and it's even written specifically, is going to be um, exchanging of thrusts and breaking of the point. So, what this is, is if he launches a thrust at me, right? If I just deflect, I can deflect it once away. So if I just try to get out here, he'll probably still hit me. I need to move offline and either launch an attack against him or destroy his attack. So, first and foremost, exchanging points. This is usually best done off of something that is somewhat tip forward that you can do it out of lava guards. So I'll go ahead and go to Finestra. He's in Pulse of Redder. When he launches this passing thrust, I'm going to direct my sword across, my arms low, and I'll plant the thrust either into his chest, his neck, or his eyes. This is also where Fiore will often make mention of armor, as this system can be interpreted as being both in armor, in partial armor, or out of armor, and that is quite a nice unifying factor. So bear in mind that he may say, if your opponent has a visor, aim lower, this guard works better in armor, etc. But, one more time on that, all that's happening is as he thrusts, I step out to the side, I guide my sword to the middle, and I exchange thrusts with him, knocking his aside, and hitting him with mine. And this can come out of a couple different positions, so same idea, but now I'm going to be in Porto di Ferro. He thrusts at me, no problem. My other alternative, let's say that 
I don't feel confident exchanging points with him, maybe he has a lot of armor, maybe I'm just not very good at it, etc., is to break the point. Uh, for this, let's go ahead and switch sides. So the idea here being is that I am going to step out to the side of his thrust, and I'm going to gain the back of his sword with my sword. Now this can be done in a couple different ways. So as he goes to thrust, I'm going to step out wide, bring my sword over his and push it down. From here I can do a couple different things, but the famous one is to stamp upon his sword, cut up, cut down. Now a lot of people really like the sword stamp and they're like, wow, that's super cool, but how do you do it? It's actually not that complicated to do. Once he thrusts at me and I break the point down, I'm going to just pick up my lead foot and push it against the flat of his blade. As long as you know to come kind of across as opposed to straight down, nine times out of ten you get the flat underneath your toe and you're in no danger. From there, just direct your cuts up as you see fit. You can thrust. You can do a bunch of things. Of course, also, you can just deliver the, the cut up initially after breaking the point. Relatively simple one, but now let's talk about our next bit. Uh, we can go back to the side. So, long range plays, relatively straightforward. We get one more, though, which is going to be one, well, we get a lot more plays, but one more that's kind of key is going to be the Copi de Villano. Now, this is basically the peasant strike, is what it translates to. And can be done against a sword or against a heavy staff or pole axe, which is why we're going to have him swing a stick at my head. Now for this, the advice we get is to stand left foot forward in a narrow stance. This could be interpreted as being in Portifero, in Corolonga, anything that puts me left foot forward. Now what's going to happen is, when he throws his blow at me, I'm going to advance my left foot off the line, then bring my right foot up across. To catch the, sword, the blow in the middle of my sword, from here I just let it go and deliver my cut at his head. Now, at first, this footwork looks very strange, but you've got to remember about the length multiplier we're talking about here. When he swings that stick, if I were just to move out to the side, yes, I'm safe, but I'm still very much not winning this reach game. Maybe I hit him, but he has a good way of putting that point between me and him. As such, I use this cross-step footwork to bring myself closer to him, which is much harder for him to avoid, as well as moving myself to the side. Now, from here, you can, of course, just deliver a simple blow. If he tries to run away from you, you're just going to step up with your left foot and then thrust in the chest, so we'll show that real quick. No real problem. Pretty simple, very good play to know, and you'll actually see it in a lot of historical manuscripts if you look at the guys fighting in the background quite closely. But, good stuff. Now, our next bit is going to be talking about, okay, what about the close range? So we played at long range, now what about close range? Close range has two forms. Basically, the easiest way to define the close range versus the long range is now both of our right foot is forward, right? Now, we're at decent distance right now for sake of demonstration. Normally, this will bring you more like here. So we're very much strong on strong. Now, from here, this is going to be all of your wrestling actions, all of your closing in, etc. And the basic idea is usually going to be either I put hand on his weapon to free up my weapon, I use my cross guard to push him up, and then do what I will do from there by bringing my left leg up, or alternatively, other sorts of wrestling actions where I use the sword as a lever. So, this can come up in several different ways. Option number one, I'm cutting at him, he brings his right foot up as well. Close range. I came in first, so I'm going to use that energy to wrestle. Option number two, I am choosing to close in with him. This is where you very much see uh, the guard of the crown. He cuts at me, and I'm choosing to move up close so that way I can execute a technique more easily. So a very useful device to know about how to close in. And like I said, those all start with your right leg being forward. However, Fiore often likes to grapple on our opponent's right side, which is a little bit unusual when you first start learning it. But the basic idea, go ahead and stand in pulse along now, right? The basic idea of your being, when he puts that right leg forward, the most dangerous place you can be is here because that's lined up with his core, lined up with his foot, lined up with all the strength of his weapon. If I am on this side, however, yes, he can, of course, pass back and try and get away from me, but the first thing, the nearest thing that I can grab is his sword arm, which is great for me because it prevents him from doing a lot of things, right? Versus, while I can still absolutely close in on that side, he can always pull his right arm away and do that. So, as such, we're going to see uh, one more powerful position, which is going to be Posidona Sinestra, which is a very big, uh, I'm a big fan of it. The idea here being that I'm going to cut out of my left side 
and I'm going to use this to enter into the close range by taking advantage of my opponent's sword arm side. So the basic idea here would be, let's say I'm mounting my support to the barrel, and I pull back, right? He goes to deliver a thrust at me, and I'm going to break the point from my left side. Oh no, now he's, he's got his sword arm forward, and I can do a bunch of different things. I can launch a thrust, I can launch a cut, I can throw my sword across his neck like we did before, I can turn him into grapples, I can just suppress his arm. Anything on this side that I want to do, I can do because I had that powerful breaking of the point that also took me off to this side. And there's a bunch of, of course, abutsare, the wrestling sections, that I can do from here. But, all in all, relatively straightforward, that's going to be the majority of his unarmored longsword. There are a couple things, of course, we left out because, you know, I'm not going to try and cover the entire system in one go. But the basic tenets are utilizing the volta stable, keeping your right leg reserved as much as you can, going out into posta longa to fight from there. Either you fight in the long range game, where you bring your right up usually to finish it, or you fight in the close range game, where you brought your right up first to close, then your left to finish it. We have some basic plays. Exchanging the point, breaking the point, and then the copi de Verano, all great things. And then we also went over the sword in one hand. Now the other things we left out that are kind of in the unarmed longsword is going to be, you know, sword versus dagger, sword versus spear, etc. Pretty much they re reflect these same sorts of principles, and so you shouldn't have much difficulty uh, putting one and two together. But either way, thank you very much, Randy. And that is going to be our so what of the unarmored longsword portion of the Flower of Battle. So hopefully you've enjoyed, and by all means go and check out the uh, So What of the Kunstesfektens as well. Both are wonderful sets of longsword to learn and practice and use. Um, the best thing about it is appreciate them. Uh, occasionally put them against each other, but they're both perfectly valid, whichever one sings to you more. But either way, thank you very much for watching, and we will go over some other techniques and systems another time.